Hey, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13. Today we're going to finish up this, this short series. Uh, we actually start the book of Daniel next week. Uh, and it'll not be Daniel like maybe if you've ever been in a church that taught Daniel and it, it was turned into a newspaper theology course of how to find out what's happening uh, and when Jesus is coming back and pin the tail on the Antichrist. It won't be that kind of Daniel. Uh, but it's going to be a, a real emphasis upon uh, faithfulness in exile, uh, faithfulness in the midst of a, of a, a secular world. How do we maintain uh, holiness? And it's just great, great picture. Tim and I are really excited about it. So uh, that'll start next week. But today we're going to finish this, this beautiful hymn of love uh, that is often utilized by couples getting married, both Christian and non-Christian alike, but in the context of 1 Corinthians, as we stated the first week, it really is an indictment by the Apostle Paul, and Paul uses uh, 1 Corinthians 13 to remind the church that the only tangible evidence that they indeed are followers of Jesus is their love, the only tangible evidence that the only thing that compels the world to turn to Christ is Jesus working through his people in agape love, our surrender to his. And remember, the first week, we defined the difference between agape and eros. Eros is self-possessive love. Agape is self-giving love, self-sacrificial love. It's, it's a love that actually acts God actually moved into his creation, into human history. He took into himself through his son the brokenness and the frailty of human flesh, bending it back into righteousness for the sole purpose uh, through his sacrifice, which culminated at the cross of Calvary, for the sole purpose of restoring relationship with himself, with others, and with ourselves. That, that agape love restores relationship in three directions. And it's essential that we get it because eros is, is our natural uh, reset. That's our natural inclination because eros is when we love for the purpose of satisfying self. It's a self-possessive love. And the fact is, is that just because you've been born again does not mean that eros will not reveal itself. It'll reveal itself a multitude of ways every single day. And this is why we must die a thousand deaths that we might be resurrected in the fullness of life. I want to um, just share with you guys a story before we jump into this, into this final portion of 1 Corinthians 13. And that is, you know, a couple weeks ago when we started this series, um, I was in the worst mental space I've ever been preaching. And God still worked through it. In fact, I got more kind emails about the message, but I felt inside chaotic. And in my head, I was like, if I ever preach like that again, I will never preach again. Uh, which is so funny because the whole purpose of the message was to talk about that, that agape is you're not thinking about self and that preaching often becomes an act of eros where you're concerned about your performance. And then I was totally stressed about my performance. Uh, and, but there was a reason for it is that the week before on Wednesday, I'd received a phone call uh, midday from my wife Darcy, and she was, uh, and I could tell immediately that something was wrong. That she was extremely distressed, and and she said, "Honey, I think something's really wrong with me. I'm having a ton of pain uh, on my right side, and I, I'm, it's scaring me because it's making it hard to even walk, and it, I've, I keep having dry heaves." And so immediately, you know, the thought was she's having an appendicitis or possibly kidney stones, and so I just got on my motorcycle and just the most illegal driving ever. Like, I was Mad Max. It was exhilarating, uh, just insanity. Uh, and I got all the way from southeast to inner northeast in, in five minutes, which is pretty impressive. Uh, and since then, I've done it twice. I want to just confess that with no emergency. <laughs> uh, my, my wife reminds us that we need, I'd like my husband, your kids need a father, and the church would like to keep their pastor. Um, so... Uh, I'm sorry for that. But I get home, and she's uh, in there. She is just pale and 
I mean, it was scary. Like I was like, oh, and so I just rushed her straight uh, to the emergency room. And my wife's always said like, I am best in emergencies. Like I'm a guy that you'd probably like would want to, like I'd, I'd be a good guy on the front line. Like I get a weird, like I'm exhilarated by emergencies. Problem is, is that I create emergencies to keep myself motivated. <laughs> so it's not so fun to necessarily live with or work for, but, uh, um, and that just shows my overarching instability and why uh, people need, I'm, I'm probably used by God to, to reveal uh, the, the truthfulness of a person's walk with Jesus uh, because it takes a tremendous amount of agape uh, to, to live close to me. Uh, so I get her to the hospital and, and they start running skin. The first thing they did was a blood test to see if it was kidney stones and, and, or urine test to see if it was kidney stones that wasn't. CAT scan, kidneys looked fine, appendix looked fine. Uh, they, they were checking all this stuff and they're like, we don't know what's causing this. Ultrasound ends up after six hours of being in the emergency room, my wife being in so much pain, she can't even talk. She said it was worse than labor. Um, we get a, a surgeon that comes in and says that, that, it, that there's nothing, nothing seems to be wrong with, the, with her ovaries and therefore uh, all they can see in the CAT scan was that there's a, there's a, a, a mass and, uh, um, and that she's gonna need to see a surgeon like that, that next week. And we're like, a week? Like, I don't, I don't even see a surgeon right now. Um, and so when I showed up on Sunday to preach on agape love, that was the uh, kind of the beginnings of my unraveling. Now, here's the thing for me is that I actually, I'm a passionate person. I come across as maybe like in, more in tune with my emotions than I actually am. Uh, and I, or maybe I don't, I don't, maybe I just seem like a jerk. I don't know what I seem like, but I, but I, I really had some, God show me some hard things about myself. And that is as the, as the stress and the fear of my wife having cancer, having lost two friends to cancer in their forties, we know that it's not, it's not an impossibility by any means. They, the fear manifested itself, not in, not in care and gentleness, for my wife, but it, it started to manifest in this sort of self-focused way where I started getting really bitey with Darcy because I was thinking about like, oh my gosh, like the church doesn't even realize like you like actually helped me function as a human being. Like I don't think I could be function in life without, without Darcy. But my, I realized that, that the, the emotion was driven more by what I would lose rather than what she was going through. Uh, and, and it was just like this one moment of, inc- of insight into a, a real sickening side to humanity that even our grief, our fear, our concern for another can still be totally self-motivated. Uh, and, and it kind of, it kept calling me where Darcy's like, you're just not being very nice and I'm terrified. And, um, and she's just like, it's weird how stress reveals itself in people, how we respond to those things. And, and it challenges our uh, it challenges the, the foundation that we're functioning from. And so it, it kind of hit its peak uh, last week when, when um, Tim preached, because right before, the day before Tim preached on the second message, we finally, after a week of not knowing and blood tests and a surgeon saying we need to go in and do surgery, and we were ready to do surgery, and it, that her OBGYN looks at the, the scans and the ultrasound, and they're just like, you don't have a tumor, that's just your ovary moved it's like it not in the right place uh and and that's why you were keeled over i did not know that if a woman's over returns it's kind of the same as a man getting kicked in the groin really hard uh so uh so it, we almost we went for like a week and a half thinking that she had cancer and she's gonna die in fact she was talking about the day after her birthday was the day i preached and uh, she was like, oh my gosh, I felt so good. I was like putting it out of my mind. And I got to church and everyone that knew like just looked at me like I was already half dead. They're like, I'm sorry. She's like, that was awkward. <laughs> I don't want to go to church again when that happens. But, uh, but it, it ended up not even being, I mean, it's not, definitely not life-threatening. She still may have to have surgery, so pray for her. But, uh, but to go through that, it, it was a wake-up call to like what is precious, but even more like what, what is the foundation I'm functioning from? Because we're hitting seven years in the church. And I realized that, that over the last seven years, there's been this increasing move toward ministry becoming the focal point of my life rather than 
the motivation of ministry, which is Jesus. And it starts playing itself out is that as I'm looking at serving Jesus becomes my identity rather than Jesus himself, that it started playing out, playing out in, in my personal life. And that really came to a head when I was looking at the potential of a real personal tragedy or disaster. It was like a revelation of my own brokenness and something that has been fundamentally lost in me over the last couple of years that God's been slowly restoring and kind of used this in both Darcy and my life as a, as a means of what matters in life because we set ourselves and our focus upon things that don't last. Churches don't last. Jesus lasts. And as long as we stay attached to him, the church has a chance of surviving. And yet, churches are often led by men and women who function in eros far more than they function in in agape, who live not by restored relationships, but not in relationship at all. We should be troubled that the majority of the evangelical world is being led by people without relationships, when that's the essence of the gospel, to restore relationships. Isn't that troubling? Uh, and, and so all of this kind of brought out in me this, this reality that I have slowly lost my center. It's not that I don't love Jesus, and the beautiful thing, as we're going to see in the text today, is that agape, it, it lasts. And so even if we've lost sight of it, if we've ever tasted it, we should be encouraged by the fact that it's there for us in the moment we're willing to turn back to it. So I want to begin with this, this slide, having shared share that story. I want to begin with this slide because Darcy and I really had serious come to Jesus after Tim's. That was the best, like, like I've never seen Tim like do, the, do the, the preaching sucker punch before. And he really got us on that last line. You know, Tim is such a gentle creature. And at the end of it, he's like, and who have you failed? And I thought, well, he's going to follow that up with something. And he's like, Jesus, we just, I'm like, what? Whoa. Like, <laughs> Tim Mackey, good one. Uh, so, and Darcy said, she goes, Tim, when you put that slide up of the black hole, I just kept picturing my husband's head coming out of it. I almost created a slide of a black hole with my face in the middle of it for you guys today. So I, I want to just remind you, agape, or self-giving love, is the basis of Christian living. It's the basis of it. 1 John 4.19 We love, some of your translations say we love him because he first loved us. That's actually incorrect. We have the ability to love like Jesus because he first loved us. He is the source. Now, we're told uh, to, to, when we read through the list of the characteristics of agape love, to just put the name of Jesus in everywhere it says love. And that is actually helpful, but we need to be careful to not become too abstract because this still is the way of the Christian. And it's a path that must be tread. But it's to be tread in the power of the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit is the one who places, pours the love of God out in our hearts, as it says in Romans 5. But it begins, it's the the foundation. It begins with Jesus. It begins with his work. Agape love is is an alien love. It is not natural to your human... It's not a love that evolves. It's not a love that grows. It is a perfect love from the beginning that changes us in our ability to love um, as we surrender to Christ. So it's the basis. It's the foundation. It's not what we do for Jesus. It's not, it's not the power of what we know about Jesus. It is how we are to live that gives the evidence that we truly belong to Jesus. But agape is more than just the basis of Christian living. It's, Agape, or self-giving love, is also the motivation of Christian living. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ controls us. Now, some of your translation says compels us. And I would argue, once again, those Greek words uh, often hold multiple meanings, and we try to dice them up, and it means both. What controls us is also the thing that's compelling us. Uh, and, and the love of Christ compels us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. That the only thing that motivates the Christian to live like Jesus or to surrender to Jesus is probably a better way of putting it, is the one who truly believes that Jesus loved them. 
I went away on, uh, on Monday morning. Uh, I was invited last minute to fly to the Antone uh, Ranch over in Eastern Oregon. It's a giant ranch uh, that a, a couple um, that I've been very close to over the years owns. And they, um, they brought a group of pastors, flew a group of pastors uh, to go have a time of fishing and shooting ground squirrels. Um, and pastors are funny. Most of us have never shot guns, especially me. And actually, this group of pastors seem to be quite comfortable with guns. I like caught a 10-pound trout, and I always caught the smallest trout. And I was like, all right, I caught one. Can I go back to the house now and read a novel? Um, luckily, Luis Palau was with us. And Luis Palau's like me. He's just a city guy. I'm like, I don't care how tough these guys are or how well they shoot. I can outdance any of them. Uh, and uh, so Luis and I went, went back to the house. And to, man, to sit with a man who's, who's 70 years, I mean, he's, he's 82. He got saved at 12. He was preaching at 18. I can't tell you how weird. I've known him for several years. He's so humble. He's so down to earth that I forget that he's like famous. I mean, he's in the Christian world, the guy is one of the last great mass evangelists. And he, <laughs> he's never actually said this to me before, but we asked him at the table, we're like, Luis, you're the most famous person here. How have you maintained humility? And he goes, you know, once when I was in Germany, Billy said to me, <laughs> like, are you kidding? Billy Graham, really? <laughs> Billy once said to me, like this first, he, he tra- I forgot that he had like, he had, worked under Billy Graham, he traveled with Billy Graham. He's like, Billy said to me, you know, theologians wrestle over what is meant by humble yourself before the Lord and in due time he will exalt you. Uh, theologians wrestle over what that means. He goes, but Luis, I, I just believe it means what it says. And so each day it is my responsibility to lay myself down at the feet of Christ. And he goes, and he goes, and the way that I've interpreted that is I basically have come to the conclusion that the only way to live, and he goes, and, and he goes it's really quite easy. I'm a slave of Jesus. And because I'm a slave of Jesus, I am free to love. And, uh, and just such simplicity, a man who is so compelled, the thing that has kept, because I have worked for guys who have blown up their lives and their ministries. In fact, this is fascinating. Uh, there was a study done in 2013, uh, and 264 or something like that, pastors actually blew up their lives and their churches through moral failings that year. And they were, I think it might have been Barna that did the, did the research, but out of the 260-something, like 258 of them said that the reason, when asked how they came to a place of moral failure, they said because they were not known by anyone. That's the antithesis of the gospel, because the gospel should produce in us agape love, which is about giving ourselves away to Christ and to one another. And when Luis talks, I look at a man who's actually still married, still going strong at 82, still, still filled with so much joy in life, articulate and clear, and just and captivating and remembers everybody's name, uh, is that he is motivated and, and is driven by this one simple fact, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that motivation compels everything that he does. And it's just, I just realized that you will not serve Jesus if you don't believe fundamentally, foundationally, that he loves you. It was one of the, the things that, was, that we got in an argument over, Pastor. There was, a, there was a gentleman in the group that really struggled with believing when he failed uh, that, that God still loved him. And, it, and we, we may not struggle, we may not be able to articulate that, like, oh, I did this, therefore God doesn't love me, but we still actually believe it. We still, act, and what that shows is that we still think that there's something fundamentally in us that's worth saving and that our performance really will impact how God loves us. No, our performance, if it is not derived from his love as the basis, uh, it, it will not last. It'll have no, it, it's like a skipping stone. It's like you may get like 20 skips, but ultimately it will sink out of sight and be buried in the silt at the bottom of the pond. 
And I think that this is, this is the only thing that will keep us going, is that love motivates. My love of music keeps me playing music, not the discipline of playing. <laughs> and so I think that this is important. And I think if I can get the next slide, finally, that it's not just... Uh, it's not just simply the basis, it's not even simply the motivation, but we actually need, uh, we need something even deeper than that. We need the confidence. Too many Christians lack confidence because they are not captivated by the living Christ. And I realized that like in the last couple of years, I'm not saying that I never functioned in agape, I'm just saying that eros was more and more getting the upper hand. And when we function in eros, then we, are, then we are forced, as a friend once wisely said to me, he said, Josh, I'm telling you, as you start the church, don't ever lose your anointing. And all he meant by that is don't ever lose uh, sight of the fact that apart from the spirit working and flowing through you, you, have, you don't have much to give people because you'll have to rely on your, on your cleverness and that won't take you very far. We need a confidence that is based on something outside of ourselves because I am not confident in myself. And agape is the source, the confidence of Christian living. Romans 8, 37 through 39. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are we or are we not conquerors in Christ. What is agape love in its essence? If it's defined by the cross, it's defined by a definitive act, an act that actually took place in human history. The moment when the God-man became, he who knew no sin became sin and conquered death. We need a, a proper reinstatement of Christ as victor. That we are not just simply the church triumphant, but we are also the church militant, and we will not be the church militant. That is the willingness to actually enter into battle if we do not have something worth dying for. And the thing is, is that Jesus alone, that agape love, that divine love that comes, as we, that comes into focus and comes through us and works um, into our community as we surrender to Christ, it doesn't, it doesn't happen until we surrender. But the moment we surrender is the moment we find that Jesus is there. He's tangible. Which brings me to this, because I think that the, Paul's statement is that love lasts, and that's where we have the close of 1 Corinthians 13. If we can get the next slide, please. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, that is perfect love, the perfect, Jesus' work on the cross is complete, total. You can't add to it. When he comes into our lives, his agape love, it actually puts aside the things that we put. We put our, all of our attention on on things that will pass away. Even the gifts of the Spirit, is he, he's not trying to diminish the church's usage of the, of the gifts of the Spirit, but he says, listen, the gifts of the Spirit, our ability to comprehend the Scriptures by the, by the Spirit's illumination, our ability to do signs and wonders, to speak in tongues, all of these things, they have to derive their purpose from a right understanding of God's love toward you in Jesus, a love that is poured out by the Spirit. If you do not love, then when you speak in tongues, he says, you say nothing. He says, when, if you do not function in agape love, that when you, you can know the scriptures inside and out, but if there's no love, it's a dead book in your hands. He says, if you do not love, you can give all your possessions away even, and even die a martyr's death. He said, it absolutely means nothing. You say nothing, you are nothing, you mean nothing without agape. I mean, Paul uses these incredible, this incredible chapter to bring an indictment toward the, the natural inclination of the human heart to function in self-possessive love rather than surrendering to the only one who can birth agape love in and through our lives. The world does not function in agape. Christians have held from, from its beginning that agape is something that is divine in nature and origin. doesn't mean that people aren't capable of loving one another. It's just not ever a pure 
self-giving love. That is functioned solely in what God has done for humanity and is made available to us by his spirit. But I think this is powerful because here he defines a love that lasts. And that Greek word means literally that love can't fall. It can't, agape love doesn't fall. It doesn't collapse. This love never folds under pressure of the most intense and sustained kind. This love continues through death into eternity. This is the love of God. God's love, while we were yet still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us, that this love is so powerful that it was actually able to pass through death, conquer it, and overcome it. Resurrection, ascension to the right hand of the Father. This love is the basis for tongues. This love is the basis for knowledge. And I think that this is one of the challenges that often we mistake the means for the end. And these things are meant to serve love, to be a revelation to love. This is why I was talking with someone the other day who believed that God had spoken to them. And I said, if God speaks to you and it's truly from the Holy Spirit, it will always point to Jesus. And if it doesn't point to Jesus, I don't believe it. Because there are lots of spirits and we're told to test them. And there's a lot of voices that are vying. I hear voices all the time. I don't know what that says about me, uh, but I definitely don't trust the majority of them. And so I think that this, this is one of those realities that we have to understand that, that here we have uh, the, the, these gifts that are meant to be utilized for the purpose of expressing agape love. But too often, I think within hyper-charismatic worlds, we see that the gifts become the end in and of themselves. And because of that, they lose their meaning. And, and you have pride in experience. And on the other side, I think sometimes within extremely reformed camps or where you see the Trinity as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Scripture, you see that, that the word or knowledge becomes the end in and of itself. And that becomes pride and knowledge. And both miss the mark because grace is God's deep concern for me, a willingness to actually be there with me, for me in Jesus as I surrender to him. His agape love is manifest and the gift of the spirit is that. It's the spirit's prerogative to gift the church as he sees fit. And it's for the purpose of making agape love known because Jesus said, this is the only way. This is the only way that the world will know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another, not by your ability to recite scripture, not by your ability to do signs and wonders. None of that is evidence. Remember, in Pharaoh's court, the magicians were able to counterfeit all of the miracles of Moses for the most part. And I think that we need to, need to recognize that the supernatural is not, not the evidence that you belong to Jesus, nor is some sort of powerful intellect that allows you to, to regurgitate scripture. We need God's spirit pouring the love of Jesus out in our lives and it needs to be manifested. Then those things can serve that reality. That reality. Is that your reality? We're more than conquerors in Christ, but isn't it interesting that all the things that Paul said um, can't rob us of the love of God, the one thing he doesn't list is us, for we are the worst enemy. We do seem to have an incredible ability of overriding uh, God's uh, redemptive work in our lives. Uh, and and it's a, it is a, I always say that we cannot, we cannot prevent God from fulfilling his purposes and plans for his creation, but we seem to be able to prevent him from doing that work within ourselves uh, when we refuse to surrender to his agape love. So we can go to the next slide, um, please. Love lasts, and that lasting love should be the thing that inspires you to know that each day is a new day in him. Because we move then toward the fact that love completes in, in verses 11 and 12. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. So this is an, a movement toward mat maturity. And he says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. We are moving toward completion toward a 
toward a, a, full, a full realization of this agape love, this new birth should be moving us toward an ultimate goal. And that ultimate goal will be seeing Jesus, the object of our faith and hope, face to face. But I like what Paul says. He says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And people often think that, that we need to put aside the childlike. This is not about childlikeness. Childlikeness, I would argue, is, ne- is necessary to actually enter the kingdom of heaven, according to Jesus. He said, unless you become like a little child, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. But childishness is something totally different. Childlikeness is perpetual growth. It's humility. It's wonder. Childishness. That is such a hard word for me to say. I don't know why. Uh, To be childish is stunted growth. It's immaturity. It's a refusal. Uh, to be transformed. Paul says, I put aside those things. It's another way of saying what he says in Romans 12. I beseech you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice. You're laying down the lie of who God never intended you to be, and that is being crucified with Christ. I must die a thousand deaths so that I can resurrect into the newness of life each and every day. Almost all the promises of Scripture have a now and not yet reality. Uh, It's done, but still needs to continue to be worked out with fear and trembling. And he says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. And here's where I think the kicker, our completeness is a completeness in knowledge, but it's not knowledge for knowledge's sake. I often say that God's omniscience, his knowing, I don't ever use the word omniscience in a normal conversation, it's dumb and not helpful, Uh, but knowledge, perfect knowledge, which we're told that God has, it's not knowledge for knowledge's sake. In fact, there is not a single place in Scripture that declares any attribute of God that is not directly connected to his relationship with people. Everything he reveals about himself is directly connected to how he feels about people. Isn't that incredible? Why? Because God is a relational God. This is why I am so deeply concerned. It's, it's something that's been on my heart. It's what, it's what this scare with Darcy revealed in myself is that what I started to become over the last two years as the church has grown and the pressure of leading the church has increased is that I have become more and more isolated. And as we moved into the new offices, it's like the church missed, the staff missed me. Well, I don't know if they miss me now because I'm there every single day, just there to enjoy them draw them into, as Tim called, the vortex of Josh White, which is whatever it is that I'm interested in that particular moment. Because I get all my reading and studying out of the way in between 4 a.m. and 8 a.m. So when I go to work, it's just playtime. I'm like, hey, Tom, looks like you're doing some reading. You want to see a YouTube clip of Key and Peele? I just want to love all my people. Uh, but that's not been my natural inclination. And actually, it was extremely hard for the staff to... to how do you follow a guy that's never with them? How do, you, how do you lead a church if you don't actually know who's there and you don't ever get copy? I used to get, get copy with about 20 people a week when I started the church, and I saw that increasingly diminish over the last couple of years. And that isolation was always something I swore I would never do. And that isolation is the antithesis of relational knowledge. <laughs> that it's not about knowledge for knowledge's sake. God knows you because he cares about you. That's why he knows you. He knows your thoughts before you think them because he chooses to do so because it's his sovereign right. And in that freedom, he chooses to not exist without you. He makes himself available to you. And I think that the gospel in its essence is that we were made in the image of God and that image was, dis- was distorted and perverted through the fall. For sin in its essence is self-focused, self-centered reality. I will be my own God. And what does it do? It ruins relationships. And the gospel in its nature is a restoration of relationships because we're made in the image of a God who is relational in the very essence of his being. The image of God being restored is just the, is the ability to be in right relationships restored. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. And yet, we come to a place often where we try to live out the gospel. I, want, I just wrote a new song, and it says, Lord, you know I love you, but I struggle with your friends. 
And that sounds more like a bumper sticker. But the fact is, is that, Lord, I love you, but I struggle with your friends. But then the next line in, in the song is, but you said this is, this is the means by which that end is even known. I can't say I love you, Jesus, and struggle with your friends without being a liar because John himself said, if you say you love God and hate your brother, then the love of God is not in you and you're a liar. What do you do with that verse? And so this knowledge, this love that completes is not, it's about me and Jesus. It's pers- my faith is personal. No, shut up, that's dumb. Don't ever say that again. <laughs> Unless you mean it's relational by the word personal, that's the only way that I'll accept that word. We are not born again into a vacuum. We do not have the right to be isolated. Jesus saved you that, so that through you, he could save others. That's what election's about. And so here we see, for now we see in a mirror dimly, what should be, uh, I think is a p- profound picture that Paul is using, for the, the mirror is a picture of, will you look in a mirror to look at yourself? Why does he use a mirror here? As this illustration, we see in a mirror dimly. We don't even, he's, I mean, I do think that because of our fallenness, we don't, we're an enigma to ourselves, but I think that there's even a better picture. It, it, it even has more uh, profound meaning for us in this particular context, in this age in which we live. I, I just discovered for the first time ever on my iPhone that my photo library actually has created its own folder. I didn't create a folder called Selfies. Like Apple decided that, that was a good idea. And, and what is disgusting is that that should shame us, especially if you're folder. Boys and girls, if you have more stinking selfies than you have of any other, any other folder, let's just say if you have more than, more than 100 selfies, there is, you're a narcissist. And, <laughs> and it's, it's disturbing and believe me, I, I look at Instagram. How many people post a picture of themselves on their own Instagram account at least once a week? And, and Darcy and I went through the selfies folder, and I was like, you have way more selfies than me. I'm like, I don't even have an Instagram account. She's like, yeah, but you're always sabotaging mine. You post. I'm like, whoa, did you see that picture? That was a good picture. Did you see that picture I took of myself there? And I, what's wrong with us? What's wrong with me? Why would I ever take a picture of myself? Uh, you think by the time you reach your 40s that you're, you're getting over that, that portion of your life. Like, you know, that it's all, it's all gonna, this passes, but love, agape love remains. But I do believe that it's, a, it's, it's an incredible indictment on the society in which we live. There's a new book I just saw in Powell's, I can't remember, it was so bad, I just, I, I actually tried to erase it from my mind, but the, the theme of it was this. It was a doctor who basically said that we have a better quality of life today than we've ever had in human history. We live longer, we have more available to us, more opportunity, less sickness. And, but then the doctor says, but uh, people are, are less happy than they've ever been. And so what's the, doctor's, what's the doctor's solution? He goes, we need to, we need to develop uh, a, a habit, of, uh, an attitude of gratitude. Oh, that was so helpful, doctor. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna change the world. Uh, obviously, we need an attitude of gratitude, but we're not going to get it because we need something foreign to bring transformation to our lives. This the, the problem with the self-help book is that it's not helping. It's not changing the fact that there is more people on, on medication for mental instability today than there ever has been in the history of psychology. It's not helping that, pe- that, that suicide is increasing each and every year. It's not it's not helping that people feel more lost and lonely in a crowd um, than that has ever happened in human history because we have fundamentally bought into the lie that the world and the universe is about us. Why do you think people spend their lives on their iPhones? And the next generation that's coming up, gosh, we only know. I mean, I thought Gen Xers, I mean, we're bad. We are really lame. That's just a lame generation. Uh, and... Uh, I'm just terrified for what's coming. I just I watch people, tables of people not even communicate because they're so entrenched in their own little technological fantasy. 
and, and I'm no better. And we all, we fall into it and we, we approve of it because we don't look for agape love to complete us. We look toward the world to complete us and it just leaves us empty. And this is why we need to understand that this is about relational knowledge, that this is about, about coming into a knowledge of Jesus that brings transformation. God wants you to know him. He doesn't want you to know about him. He doesn't want you to, to, to simply come to church and study him. He wants you to know that he's with you, he's for you, he will never leave you nor forsake you. This is, look at Hosea, this is a fascinating, look at this, this verse. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. It's a fascinating to me that as society progresses, as technology increases, as we live more according to our phones, that knowledge, it growing in any field of knowledge, it becomes more and more of a chore. People do not have the attention span. They don't give themselves to the word. They don't give themselves to one another. We look for self-knowledge and self-fulfillment, and it's the thing that actually becomes the most elusive to us. And then in, in Hosea chapter six, let us know, let us press on to know the Lord for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. God wants you to know him the way that he knows you. We worship and serve a God who is alive, who is here. If we don't believe that, we will fail at this. I think that our knowledge of God and our knowledge uh, of others and, our, uh, and even of ourselves is m- more like the, a&E channel biographies where you have the expert who talks about some dead famous person that they never met and it just always comes across as creepy because God wants us to know him actually, really. The essence of eternal life, said Jesus, if we can get the next slide. The essence of eternal life is this, and this is eternal life, that they know you the living, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's been my favorite verse since I became a believer, that eternal life is not, is not uh, something to be obtained, it is someone to know. It's the thing that transformed my Christian life. If we can go to the, the next slide. So, so this is, he wants to bring us to completion. Love lasts, it completes us when we rest in it, but finally love liberates us in the final verse it says so now faith hope and love abide these three but the greatest of these is love why does he say that why faith hope and love abide in these things faith and hope are important but they're not they actually take a back seat to love and i think it goes back to the first point it's because love lasts and because faith and hope we trust faith from a biblical perspective is a dependence upon a God that we cannot see, but who acts on our behalf in and through us as we surrender. But someday, he says, we're not gonna be looking in a mirror dimly anymore. We're gonna see him face to face. The object of our faith will be right before us. We do not need to live by faith. We then will actually live by sight. And what about hope? Hope is a combination of both desire and expectation. I desire to be with Jesus, and I expect that that will actually happen. And once again, when we see him face to face, the object of our, our, our hope will be before us, and hope will no longer be necessary. It'll be completed. It'll be fulfilled. But love is the thing that never ends. Eternity is built upon the foundation of agape love. I think that this is really important for us to see. Look at Romans 13, 8. Love is the means and the end. Owe no one anything except to love each other. It's the only debt that is never paid in full. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The law is fulfilled. It's summed up in this one, in this one statement. Love. It's not just any love. It's not eros. The New Testament breathes new life into the word agape. Self-giving love. An active love, sacrificial love. And, it, and if you're anything like me, what this should bring you to is a need to come to terms with the very thing that Luis Palau said to us pastors at that table. The key to the ministry and the life that I have lived is that I recognize each and every day 
that I am a slave of Jesus. Now, I say here that love liberates, but what Luis Palau brilliantly is pointing out is the great paradox of the Christian life is that as we become a slave to Christ, he is the one and the, and the only one who has the ability to set us free. He says, if the Son of Man sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Our liberation comes through our attachment to Christ. And Luis is, in my opinion, one of the most free men I have ever known. Not free to do what he wants, but he has proven that it is possible to, to be free to do what is right. Free to be a representative of Christ. To live a life that is fruitful. A life that's poured out for others. It's not a life that is without pain. It's not a life that's without trials and tribulations. It's not a life that's without moments of despair, discouragement, but it is a life of, of eternal value because it is, it is built upon the one thing and the only thing that lasts, and that is the agape love of God. What can separate us from the love of God? For in Christ Jesus, we are more than conquerors. Why do we as Christians walk around so defeated? Do you believe that you can actually enjoy and be a conduit of God's agape love today, Door of Hope? Do you guys believe that? Because I'm telling you, this city will get nothing from us if we do not function in agape. This is the call upon the church. If heaven is relationship with God restored forever, hell is a place where relationship itself does not exist. Not with God, not with others, not even with yourself. It's just a place of madness. Heaven, it is possible to enjoy it as we move toward it. Because what makes heaven heaven is the very presence of Christ there, our hope, our glory, our King, our Lord, our Savior. It is he who loves perfectly and without him we can do nothing, amen? Let's pray.